We're getting close to 500 now, 513. We've broken the previous speed record. This is really is a French excellence in high-speed rail. That was how the French train company SNCF recorded one of their TGVs, breaking the rail speed record back in 2007. But the TGV wasn't the first attempt to develop high-speed rail in Europe. Efforts had first been made to overcome the formidable political, technological and financial challenges as early as the 1960s. And not only in France. It's making history listener Martin Riley, an exile in Orléans, who has brought the twists and turns of this story sharply into focus for us. And what first served to interest him was a bizarre structure which crosses the landscape for 18 kilometres just north of Orléans. He invited our producer, Nick Patrick, to join him. It's a brutalist concrete structure. It's probably about uh, maybe 15 metres high with a top, which is like an I-beam, maybe six metres wide. And between each stanchion, there's a gap of perhaps 20 metres. It looks like something that would carry a bullet train. Yeah, that's what I imagine it to be, something like what they had in Japan. We're now walking south. How far south does it go? Another five kilometres south from here into the uh, outskirts of Orléans. I can take you there, if you like. You've brought me to an industrial estate on the outskirts of Orléans. These concrete stanchions suddenly end by that road. Absolutely. Nothing to tell you that it's the beginning or the end. Something that goes on for so long, nobody's done anything with it, nobody's taken it away. It really captured my imagination, it intrigued me. What is it? Why did they build it in the first place? And then why did they abandon it? Martin Riley in the suburbs of Orléans in France. So, where best to find an answer to these questions? Well, we sent Helen Castor off to explore the beginnings of high-speed rail travel, and her destination may strike many of you as an unexpected one. We've managed to track down a French expert who can tell us all about the concrete structure that Martin discovered outside Orléans. And to meet him, I was hoping I might get a trip to Paris, and instead I've been sent to Amersham. Where else? Jerome Tillier, it's a pleasure to meet you. I gather you're going to be able to explain to us what this is all about. Bonjour, Hélène. Ah, yes, I think I know what this is all about, what Martin saw there in Orléans. Let me explain to you. Well, Helen, I think what uh, Martin saw in Orléans was the remains of the uh, French aerotrain uh, railway. It's an experiment that happened about 1969 until 1977, and just a few French people remember what this is about. What is it about then? How did it start and how did it work? Well, it all started when uh, the French government realised that intercity trains were not that good, and the French government offered to people to come up with ideas of uh, at what they call at the time high-speed transportation. And uh, one day an inventor called Jean Bertin came up with a, a train that was on air cushion, not actually touching the ground. A and hover the, train? Yes, so basically it's a hover train. An aero train is a monorail train that is flying a few inches above a concrete truck. So how did Jean Bertin's idea go down with the, with the government? The French president at the time, Mr. Pompidou, loved the idea. He agreed to sponsor for the experiment and on a small truck, not the one from Orléans, smaller one in Gomez next to Paris. And the government loved it so much that they agreed to sponsor a few prototypes, bigger and bigger, faster and faster, and then in the end to build this big truck that you can see nowadays still in Orléans. So it went well, they actually signed a contract to deliver an aero train line around Paris. But in 74, unfortunately, the president Pompidou died and he was replaced by the next president, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Valéry Giscard d'Estaing didn't really like the aero train. And so he killed it off? Politically, when Valéry Giscard d'Estaing uh, ran his presidential campaign and, and won it, some of his sponsors were from the, uh, the metal industry and some of the contractors were actually delivering big contracts to the French SNCF, the French National Rail. So basically, as a natural consequence, his uh, supporters asked him to do something about the Eurotrain to kind of you know, kill it so that they could keep and secure their 
contracts. Why was it just left? Why is this concrete structure sitting there for Martin to find outside Orléans? What Martin saw in Orléans was actually, yes, indeed, the remain of the latest experiment stage, which was a full-scale, full-speed, 18-kilometer track for a jet engine aerotrain. This track was built very strongly. It's very expensive to destroy. One example I can give you is in 2007, uh, the government tried to, to build a motorway crossing through this line. They had to remove just about 120 meters of the track. It was 80,000 euros at the time to remove it. This seems to confirm our suspicion that the French have always been way ahead of us when it comes to high-speed trains. Is that the lesson we should draw from Martin's find outside Orléans? Well, actually, Helen, I have a surprise for you and for the audience. Let me take you to Peterborough. It was not just about the French. The British as well built their own version of the aerotrain. Jerome, you brought me to Peterborough. We're right by the East Coast main line, but looming above us and going nowhere, clearly on its great concrete track, is what I recognise as a kind of aero train. It's not as sleek and silver and space age as the French version, but there is a great big Union Jack on the side. Can you tell us what this is? Well, indeed, uh, Helen, this is uh, the British tracked hovercraft, also known as the hover train RTV-31. There was uh, an experiment in the 60s, 70s in the UK where the Department of Transport sponsored some kind of research into developing transportation for more modern and faster railways. So everybody knows about the advanced passenger train. And the hovercraft was uh, another parallel project that was born mm, literally at the same time. This is going on in Britain then at the same time as the research in France, but separately. Yes, absolutely. And it was almost which one is going to win the first contract and commercialize first their hover train or aero train. With us is John Turner, the manager of Railworld, the sustainable transport museum, which is where the hover train now stands and where we are. John, what went wrong with this fantastic technological project? The technology that was used for it was kind of space age for the time and the government finally decided that no money was going to be ploughed into it and they were going to look for commercial sponsorship and there was no commercial sponsorship available. Many thought that why should new money be ploughed into concrete beams? These concrete beams here were £1,000 each. With the, uh, the high-speed HST, they could use the original Victorian track, so the swing went to HST. John, how far did this hover train get before the plug was pulled? It reached 107 miles per hour around... I think it was like two weeks after it was scrapped. Jerome, in many ways this is a, a sad end to the British story of the hover train too, but here, here the prototype is being loved and looked after. It's a slightly different story in France, isn't it? It's a, it's a sad, uh, sadder story in France because we don't have people like John from Railroad Museum who's taking care uh, of this beautiful, beautiful uh, prototype. Jerome Tillier, proving that train spotting recognises no boundaries. Our thanks to him for that insight. And you can see some remarkable footage of the aerotrain by going to the Making History page of the Radio 4 website.